Okay, so let's discuss steady state devices. Uh, and by those, I mean, uh, we're going to assume the steady state uh, assumption for them. So anything that has a time dependency will go to zero. And these are devices that are by and large used quite heavily in engineering applications. And you will see them in other classes such as heat transfer, fluid mechanics, uh, uh, engine design, etc. So let's start off with uh, nozzles and diffusers, which have pictures, uh, generic pictures here uh, top right. And basically what they do is they change the area of flow. Uh, and then by playing around with, uh, with the pressure, uh, you can, you can the whether increase, uh, increase or decrease the velocity of the fluid. So in the case of a diffuser, uh, you increase the pressure uh, but then the velocity goes down. And in the case of a nozzle, you increase the velocity, but then the pressure goes, goes down. And so we're going to make the assumption for the first law that there is no change in height. And you can see that's a pretty good assumption. We're going to assume no work is being supplied or produced from these devices. And again, steady state. So those uh, terms in red uh, are canceled out. If we assume that we have only one inlet and one outlet, as you can see in those two pictures, uh, then the mass flow rate should stay as the same uh, throughout the device, and we get the, equa the characteristic equation at the bottom. You can certainly modify it in the case that the nozzle or the diffuser have uh, different assumptions in them, but by and large, those are uh, as pervasive as they get for those, two, for those two devices. Okay, we also have mixers, and those are fairly common when you're trying to basically mix two streams together, as you can see. Uh, a uh, uh, kitchen faucet is a good example, but you can also have two streams coming into a big tank and then you have to mix them, um, etc. And so when, uh, when you're dealing with a mixer, you can assume that the kinetic and potential energy will go to zero. You can assume no work is being done to these mixers, no work is being produced by them, and you're just basically mixing the two streams. Uh, generally, it's okay to assume it's adiabatic, though not always. Uh, and so in the case that those assumptions hold true, as well as the steady state assumption, you can see the first law basically boils down to uh, an enthalpy balance, uh, where you basically take the mass flow rate of each stream and multiply it by its enthalpy. Uh, you do that everything for the inlets, uh, you do everything for the outlets, and they should be uh, equal, and this is known as an energy or an enthalpy balance. Uh, so if you have two streams coming in, you would have M1, H1 plus M2, H2, and they would be equal to M3, H3, the one that comes out. That would apply to this particular case in the picture. Uh, and then uh, you can also, uh, you, should, you should probably also use the conservation of mass here. And in general, you want to use this in case you don't have enough information to solve the first law. Uh, and so uh, well, we will do an example where you could see you need to use both of those uh, to, to to get uh, the missing information. So this at the top here is known as an enthalpy or energy balance and at the bottom is known as a mass balance. Okay, uh, these classes of devices, uh, turbines, compressors, pumps, and fans all have moving parts and uh, they're used for different purposes, but their design is similar enough that we can have the same assumptions for all of them. Uh, so uh, for all of those, we would assume there's no great change in height uh, and if we assume one inlet and one outlet as steady state, uh, we arrive at the equation underneath. Uh, and basically, you only have to account for the kinetic, for the macroscopic kinetic energy, as well as the enthalpy, uh, and then uh, the Q and the W on the other side. And so to discuss what these are, uh, we will discuss them at great lengths uh, in the future as well. But to give you a kind of an, an introduction to what they do, a turbine is pictured at the top picture here. If a device has got some sort of blades, and then you have uh, an expanding gas or something like that going across that room or you know wherever you put in that construct, and the expanding gas because because it's expanding it will move in one it have it will have a directionality and it will spin these uh, these blades and as they spin you see that in the middle there's like a shaft and the shaft itself could do work it could be attached to something to do work. Uh, and, and so that's a great way to produce work from a process. So you can attach that to some sort of, uh, say, maybe an engine or something like that, and the engine will do work based on this thing uh, moving. Uh, at the bottom right, I have a centrifugal pump. 
Uh, and a pump, by and large, what it does, it gives it gives some energy into a fluid and it increases its pressure. Okay, so I could I could use it to move uh, a liquid from one area to the next. And the way this particular pump works, and it's not true for all pumps, but this centrifugal pump works this way. Uh, there's there's an eye in the middle, and it basically collects the fluid coming in. And then there is a uh, um, blades spinning, and as they spin, they distribute the fluid um, around onto the the blue rim uh, around that. And then it will it will basically by by its movement, by it, its increased movement, it will go it will go up or to the right or to the left or whatever 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 have you. So those are the two particular examples. A fan is something you have an intuitive understanding for, basically like a ceiling fan or something. You can move a gas from one area to the next by having something, something spin around. Uh, and a compressor will basically uh, increase the pressure by reducing the volume. We will talk about that as well uh, at great length. Uh, but, but those four devices um, could be by and large used by the, the equation at the bottom. Again, for any of these devices, if there's a need to include something that I did not include, easily just include, just throw that in. Okay, um, heat exchangers, basically you take, you interface two fluids and you're trying to uh, get uh, temperature to move from one fluid to another. Uh, so uh, there, there are a great, great variety of applications for this, you know, air conditioning, uh, heating, uh, if you're trying to drive a reaction or whatever it is. So you're trying to uh, interface two liquids, uh, or sorry, not necessarily two liquids, a liquid and any two fluids. Uh, and there are different geometries. I'm just sharing this with you. We're not going to talk about this in this class. I'm just kind of showing you. Uh, you can have the two fluids coming in at the same direction, in which case they're co-current flow, or you can have them come at different directions, which is basically what's shown in all of the pictures here. Uh, in which case we call that counter current flow. Uh, so, so basically the, the inlet of one is the outlet of the other. And there are different uh, geometries for the specific heat exchanger. You could, you could design them, you could discuss them. Uh, if you take a heat transfer class, they will likely do a heat exchange uh, design uh, portion of it. And you also discuss the different heat, ex heat exchange uh, mechanisms, which we're not doing in this class. But if we're looking at, uh, at it from, a thermodynamic, from the first law perspective and trying to understand the energy balance within a heat exchanger, well, we can assume that in the heat exchanger, we will have no potential kinetic energy uh, changes. Uh, also, heat exchangers should, shouldn't necessarily have work put into them. They just work by having the delta T being different. And if I have a steady state, then what we're seeing basically uh, is that we have the heat uh, is equal to the changes in the enthalpies. So it's very much similar to what we saw with, uh, with mixers, except here it's, it's being equated to the heat rather than just being equated to itself. Uh, we have a heat component to each of them. And the idea is um, from the first law that the heat lost by one fluid is, is equal and opposite to the heat uh, gained by the other fluid. And you can use both of those ideas as well as the mass balance to, to kind of characterize the, the equipment. Okay, so, uh, so that's basically what, what you're left with here. Uh, we have throttles, uh, which we will also discuss in uh, a great length when we're talking about um, HVAC systems and um, or in other cases where we're trying to uh, control the temperature uh, by basically um, stopping a flow in a certain way. And I'll, I'll show you what they look like and where they're used uh, later when we talk about uh, cycles. Uh, but in the case, this, this is very highly used in, in refrigeration uh, and in changing phases, you basically putting some sort of like a cotton plug or something like that, you, can, you, you stop the flow um, and you don't allow heat to escape uh, and you don't put any work into that, okay? And you're not really changing the area. You're not really changing the height. You just basically put like a cotton plug in the middle of the flow. And what happens as a result is that the pressure and the temperature will change, okay? Um, and, and you can see here, so from the first law, uh, the only thing that stays in the first law 
is the the enthalpies. So it's it, it ends up being similar in, to a um, to a mixer, but if I only have one uh, in one stream coming in, one stream coming out, what I'm seeing is that the enthalpy does not change across that cut and plug. So we call that isenthalpic, meaning that the enthalpy is, is constant, it's not changing. And then an isenthalpic device, uh, by keeping H constant, uh, I, I will play around with uh, the pressure, I will play around with the temperature uh, and in it. Uh, and, and, and basically, I can use that to my advantage. We will see throttling devices uh, later. And then uh, lastly, we'll talk about flow in a pipe. Uh, so if I have a, a straight pipe or a pipe that goes up a hill or down, down an incline or changing areas or whatever it is, I can try to characterize the flow in it. And when I do that, I'm basically, uh, well, I'm not basic. I'm just deriving for you here the Bernoulli equation. And the Bernoulli equation is just a consequence of the first law, just directly comes from the first law. Of course, Bernoulli, when he did it a thousand years ago, so he didn't know of the first law, we, we, it wasn't around, but um, it is derivable from, from it. So basically for uh, a, a, a pipe, a fluid going in a pipe, uh, we're going to assume that there's steady state. Um, we can, we don't have to, we can assume that there's no heat loss and there's no work from a pump or something like that, but we can include them if we needed to. But let's just say there, there isn't any Q or W. Uh, and we're going to say that the molecules themselves don't change uh, their internal energy. Okay. Uh, we can say that the um, fluid is incompressible. So if we're having a gas going through a pipe, we're going to have a harder time using the Bernoulli at this, it, the way it is written, but we can adjust it as well. So for an incompressible uh, fluid, so for basically liquid, like water going, going into a pipe, uh, we can apply the first law by saying it's steady state, uh, then getting rid of the heat and the work, okay, and then just keeping the enthalpy term, the kinetic energy term, and the potential energy term. Further, since we know that the enthalpy change is equal to du plus pdv plus pdp, and since we just said there's no change in internal energy and there's no change in volume because it's incompressible, we basically say that the enthalpy is equal to vdp. And so when I put that in that in and kind of integrate, um, I get uh, the the common the common uh, Bernoulli equation that, that uh, that you may have seen in a physics uh, class prior or that you're going to be using in a fluid mechanics class. Uh, and again, we can complicate that by saying this heat. Uh, so on the other side where this is a zero, I could still have the Q minus W. I can have heat. I can have work done from a pump. Um, and then if you take this in fluid mechanics, they use this further by adjusting this equation by adding uh, a friction term to it, saying, well, uh, we're not talking about friction here, but there's, there are frictional losses. And how, do, how does that affect the flow? But we're not doing that in this class. So this is the Bernoulli equation. Uh, you use this when uh, you have one uh, inlet, one outlet, and you have uh, uh, these, these particular assumptions, incompressible, incompressible flow with no heat or work. Okay, and let's do some uh, examples.